Danny Flexen here for Seconds Out. Delighted to be joined by Eddie Hearn. Eddie, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. I'm really good. Got a big uh, run coming up. I'm really excited about Saturday. The more I bring these two together, the more I see them face to face, the more excited I am for the fight. Now, this is the third time Seconds Out has had the pleasure of interviewing you this week. We'll probably make it four at the Lynn tonight, but I know Josh has got something special in mind for that. I wanted to talk to you about this show and another show clashing tonight, both in London, both on TV, of course. And we'll talk about the wider implications in a minute. But first of all, when you know another show's going on the same date, do any talks happen between you guys about moving one of them or changing times? September 30 was always our date. We announced this a while ago. It was before that, it was Joe Cordina in Cardiff. So, um, and then Caroline Dubois, don't forget Ellie Scottney was always fighting on the 30th. And then we had a call from Shane and the guys saying, look, looks like Sky are also going to go on the 30th. Is there any way we can manage? Like, and, and luckily we said, yes, it's not ideal for us because Ellie Scottney should be co-main event. She's having to go earlier in the night so that Shane can balance between the cards. So that's another implication of going the same night. I think, and I'm not just being facetious, but because that's a, what do they call it? Next, like not an, ours is next gen, but theirs is a future stars or, yeah. It's not as much of a concern. Like, we don't want to clash with shows because it will affect our viewership. That show, not as much, it still will, but obviously it's not a Eubank Smith or, or something like that. So I think it's quite unusual these days to do a show that doesn't clash, in all honesty. Um, but I think at the same time, in an ideal world, they wouldn't. But there's not really any conversations to say, what dates are you going on? Because what happens then is you go to your broadcaster and you go, what dates do you want us to go? And they go, September 30th, October 21st, October, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then you have to marry that up with the venues being available. Like on Saturday, we'll only have 3,000 in there, in Wembley, It'd be a nice crowd, but it's just quite, you know, fairly late notice and Jordan Thompson's never headlined a show before. Jar Bataille's the number one cruiserweight in the world, but he's not a huge international star. So realistically, we would have liked to go to a smaller venue on Saturday, but there's no other venues available. So marrying up the dates with the venues and stuff like that, difficult to do. And, you know, yeah, I've never known a conversation where a promoter that spoke to another promoter and gone, what dates are you doing because we don't want to clash? Ultimately, whatever you're told by your broadcaster, you will do. The zone have said to us in conversations, look, if we can avoid a clash, obviously we can, but that's the answer. What about in terms of ring walks and when different fights fight? Obviously, you've had that chat because of Shane and Ellie, depends, but generally. It depends on the size of the show. Like, if you've got two big shows, like, with all due respect to both shows on Saturday night, it's not really going to matter that much to the overall viewing makeup of the fight, who goes at 9.30 and who goes at 10 o'clock. Caroline Dubois is a great young prospect. He's fighting a fairly one-sided fight that she's going to look good in. It's, and that, that's a showcase event for the younger fighters. Ours is the number one fighter in the division for the IBF and Ring Magazine Championship. We're not going to look at a show like that and say, oh, we've got to be strategic about the ring walk times. Now, we would do if it was a major show. I mean, Eubank Smith was a good example. If we were going on that night, we would say, shit, like, we need to actually think about what time that's on. Um, yeah, so, like, obviously, I think it's just important to be smart and not to have the... Like, in the past, maybe I would have had the ego to say, I don't care, you know, like, we're a bigger show anyway. And generally, I'm, that's true. <laughs> yeah. But, of course, like, your broadcaster will say to you, Guys, can we just be a little bit strategic, especially if it's a pay-per-view? You know, pay-per-views, it's very interesting to think about what time those main events will be. Generally, they're a little bit later because you want to drive the sales for interaction during the night. Think about it, the later you go, the more buyers you're going to have, really, as you build the show up. But I think traditionally, main events are too late. And where we can get closer to 10 o'clock, the better. Now, you could argue that at shows like this clashing both on TV and at the gate are an inevitable consequence of having, what, five TV promoters in the UK currently. Another could be that the shows are, by essence, diluted in quality as a result. W would you go along with that? I'm not digging at your shows particularly, but as a whole. I think when you look at how far British boxing has come <laughs> and the levels of shows now and, like, the qualities of shows across all broadcasters, like, we're in a good place, really. I mean, look, Joyce Zhang really good fight like it's a big heavyweight fight 
This week's, you know, medium size for us, Wood Warrington next week. You know, these are fights. You know, Joyce Sang could have been, and I know it wouldn't have gone down well, a pay-per-view fight. Wood Warrington could be a pay-per-view fight, and it might not go down well. So Taylor Cameron would, would have been, in my old days, a pay-per-view fight, and it's not. So I think we have to be sensible and honest and look at the landscape and say... I know not every show is going to be a barn burner, but let's look at what we're getting. As a fight fan, really, you're getting fights every week, sometimes two or three fights on the same night. Do you understand? So I think boxing's in a good position, British boxing's in a good position, schedule, like, and we've got c competition between promoters. There was a time, and I'm not just blowing our trumpet, where we didn't really have any competition. Like, I never felt like we took our foot off the gas, but now I will say that you're in a situation where we're, you know, we're up against it. We're challenging Sky. Sky changes his own. TNT are out there. You have got Channel Five. And, you know, it's, I think British boxing is in a really great place. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one because in a ideal world, you want competition to drive you to greater heights. But the flip side of that is there's more demand on the talent available and more demand on the dates available. Is that an issue? Are there certain fighters you think? Well, I think, I think you know the the one thing that we're looking to do now is say no more to fighters and teams. Because contrary to popular belief, we want real fights throughout the whole card. Like particularly the obviously the, the main portion of the card, yeah. So when a fighter comes to us and says, Oh well, I'd like a little run out there, I said, No. Enough's enough. You just had a run out. So now you're in a big fight. Oh no, hang on, yeah, it's like, and the answer's got to be no. I've been guilty in the past of folding to advisors and managers and friends as well who just say, come on, just, we just need a little 10 rounder there and it's like, no. And we've got to do better than that because I feel like a lot of the time people just do that. People just say yes. And when you sign a fighter, I've seen it so many times and you know, this is definitely a situation with signing any new talent, you always have to give them one or two run outs, easy ones. And they're the fights that hurt you. Now, they're the fights that you would have that conversation with and go, that's not a very good card, that's an average card. But sometimes the fight team will go, all right, well, we'll have an easy 10-rounder and then we'll have a big fight. Do you know what I mean? So um, we've got to be tougher and prepared to lose fighters if they're not in it. The, at the same time, we don't want to just say, you have to fight this person. But when they're ready and they've had those fights, enough's enough. You mentioned pay-per-view a, a few moments ago and Dan Raphael, notable US journalist, has gone in a little bit. Um, to use the YouTube parlance on uh, Pro Grey and Haney being on pay-per-view. Uh, what did you make of his comments? He's basically saying it kills the show with it being behind a paywall. It definitely doesn't kill the show, but, you know, unfortunately, and we look at, you know, I don't know whether they're rumours or what they are about Showtime leaving boxing. The model doesn't always work. When you've got a fighter like Devin Haney, who's just boxed on pay-per-view, who's just boxed Lomachenko, and he wants a certain amount of money, and Regis Pro Grey wants a certain amount of money, sometimes... The only way the business works is for the broadcaster to do it on pay-per-view. In an ideal world, there'd be no pay-per-view, and I think you know it'd be all part of a subscription or, or free to air. Um, but it's a tremendous fight, and I've not seen, honestly, obviously it's America, they don't moan as much as the British fight fans because I just don't think they're as embedded or passionate about boxing. And but they used the pay-per-view model for a lot longer. Yes, but I haven't really seen that much criticism outside of some of the you know, respected journos, as, yeah, yeah, and it's like, well, everything else, like, it's almost like, well, everything else is pay-per-view, what, that, that's a, that's almost like a fight fan's mindset, which is not, you know, I'm not saying that's right, but, you know, if you bought Haney Loma and you bought, I don't know, Javonte against Isaac Cruz, and you bought, you'd certainly buy Haney against Regis Progre, so, um, yeah, I get it, I get it, I, listen, you know, we've had the pay-per-view debate for 15 years, um, if it could have been made non-pay-per-view, then no problem at all. But that's the, the model. Something that we used to ask you and Adam Smith at Sky about when you guys were still working together was, is there any pressure put on you by the broadcaster, so in this case the zone, about how many pay-per-views or how often pay-per-views should be in a year, for example? No, definitely not from the zone. I mean, look, when I was with Sky previously, they never said to us, we need a pay-per-view, we need a pay-per-view. But my remit was obviously do pay-per-views and they, you know boxing was a huge business for Sky you know we were doing five pay-per-views a year plus AJ do you know what I mean and every pay-per-view was doing 250 300 500 700 
Um, I do think that not that model has changed, but I think I'm not sure how much legs there's in pay-per-view beyond big, big fights to consistently hit numbers. But no, not from the zone, because it's a different model. You know, they say the main reason that pay-per-view was introduced with the zone was it so that they could bring those big fights to the zone. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's like if you want to do Eubank against Ben, if you want to have AJ on your platform, you need that functionality. So they brought in that functionality and it allows them to do those big fights. And KSI against Tommy Fury is a good example. I know it's not necessarily our cup of tea, but it's massive, massive. Could do a million buyers on the zone. Will you watch it? Yeah, I will, because I actually think it's quite a good cut. Like, I mean, I'll tell you, you know, Dylan Dennis against Logan Paul, Slims against Salt Pappy. Like, it is a lot of the Slim, big names. Slims. Slims, I don't know. Even Slim. on it, that not I don't know. Too. Yeah, so I prefer Slims. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think that, uh, you know, I think it's a good format. Um, and I understand they couldn't, you know, KSI and Logan Paul, they're not just going to take a regular rights fee deal because you're not going to, you can't put that kind of guarantee in place. They want, to, they want it on pay-per-view. And important to have that functionality if you're going to be a, a, a big name in that fight. In terms of matchroom shows rather than the Misfits realm, has there been a UK pay-per-view on zone no. this year? Why not? Because uh, it fell through because of a failed drugs test. And so did one last year. So we had, we, since we've been with zone, we've had two pay-per-views planned. One was Eubank Ben. And one was AJ White, and they never happened. So I'm yet to do a pay-per-view, <laughs> but I might do one in December. We'll see. Which would be Eubank Ben, presumably. Do you anticipate that happening in the UK? I anticipate it happening. <laughs> yeah, um, that's why I added in. Yeah, the UK. I, th I think that. I don't know. I mean, look, it's going to take the board to realise that they're not going to win an appeal. Which I'm not saying that's fact, but like that is the general consensus within the situation to say he's been through the process, he's won the case, he's won the appeal. It's been 18 months that like, he is going to return to box in the UK for it to happen. But that fight is going to happen. And it's not one for the board where we say, well, if you don't do it, it's going to happen elsewhere. That, that, that's not the way it should be. What the way it should be is to have a sensible conversation, which has never happened, where we sit down and say, look, this is the situation. We've, we've won the case. I know you're not happy, but that happened. And everyone keeps, even respected journalists, keep failing to acknowledge that Conor Ben won the case. And his suspension is lifted. And he is cleared to box. And they hate to say it. They can't bring themselves to say it. That's actually fact. Now, if you're not happy with how that case went. A lot of people don't actually know, but they've heard this and they've heard that. I understand. And if you don't think that Conor Ben's cleared his name in the way that you want him to clear his name, I understand. But don't go away from the fact that he went through the process with UCAD and he won the case. Now, when you sit down with a board, you say to the board, look, guys, are you going to appeal? Oh, oh, you know, they have to lodge money, they have to do this, they have to do that. Yes, yes, we're appealing. Okay, are you really going to appeal? If you are, can we hurry up, please? Because we're going to win the appeal. And we want to get moving. Or the ball can look at it and say, he's won the case, he's going to win the appeal. We can't actually stop him from fighting in the UK because he's not suspended, he's not found guilty of anything. So we're going to license Eubank against Ben. Now if they say we're not prepared to do that at the time, we do it internationally. But we want the fight to happen in the UK and it's not, and we're not looking to turn the screw or put the pressure on, it's just a case of, he's just boxed in America. He's gonna box again internationally we want him to box in the UK if they won't allow it then that's another conversation but if if they won't allow it because you know like there is a legal position when a fighter has won a case has had his suspension lifted has no ban has no reason to not be allowed to fight and you don't let him fight that becomes a problem in itself do you know what I mean and we've not been down that route yet and we don't want to we just want to have a sensible conversation but when we try to reach out for a sensible conversation it's not allowed. So do you want to have that conversation before Connor reapplies for his license? That conversation six months ago because it was out of control because he's saying this, he's saying that, but no one wanted to do it. But now he's won his case, we're still open to have that conversation. And, and the, the next move for us is to say, and one of the problems, you know, when you look at the ABC, the Florida Commission, all these people, they all reached out to Robert Smith. 
and said, can you confirm that Conor Ben is suspended? And, well, he either said yes or ignored it because he couldn't bring himself to, like, you know, it's a conversation, Danny, where the ABC says to the board, OK, this Conor Ben situation, is he suspended? Uh, no, he's not. OK, so, but he was suspended, wasn't he? Yeah, he was suspended. Oh, what happened? Oh, he won the case and he was cleared, but it, we're appealing. OK, but at the moment, he's not suspended. No, he's not. And that, Robert sort of told that to some people, but couldn't quite tell it to others because it just, it's too much to say. But, like, you can't stop him from fighting when he's won his case. And again, I appreciate some people might like it, some people might like it, but the fact is, if you go through that procedure and win, you can't then turn around and say, I know you won, but hang on a minute. No, we're not happy with that. It doesn't work like that. So if there's going to be appeal, let's hurry up. But we will put in that application to box in the UK and see where it goes. And that's him applying for his licence, basically. That's him. Two ways. You can either do what Tyson Fury does. Quite as a form. Yeah, and ask for permission to box, which has to be granted. It's no real... I say it's not that... And that's not a one of slipping in, you know, and doing something different, you know. But ultimately, you either do that or you apply for a licence. I'd like him to do the latter. I don't think any British fighter should fight on an international licence when they compete in the UK. So if Robert Smith's watching this, and I know he's a big Seconds Out fan, what would you tell him? I would say, let's just get in a room and have a conversation. Don't worry about going on talk sport and saying that. Have a conversation with us, the team, the fire. And if you don't want to talk to me, talk to Conor Ben, talk to his lawyers, and try and find a resolution or get a move on or do something rather than stalling all the time. Because by stalling, what it's done is it's allowed Conor Ben to fight. And once he's fighting, which he is now, everybody's happy for him to fight. But we're not, we don't want to disrespect the ball. We, you know, we value their opinion. We, but everybody said Conor Ben's got to go through UCAD. He has to. We know it's WBC, but he has to go through UCAD. He did. And he won it. And I'll tell you again, he did not win the case on jurisdiction. You know, I can't talk about, you know, and I shouldn't even say that, but I've said it before and I'll say it again. And that's the question. Oh, yeah, but he won. You know. So there's a lot of things that people don't know. Is there, would we like to produce more information to people? Yes, we would. But we've produced all the information we've been asked to produce within the hearings. So, you know, round and round in circles, but I feel quite strongly to the fact that if you, ha if you go to trial and win, that has to be considered in people's opinion. You know what I mean? I think it muddies the waters, perhaps. I don't want to take this too long because there's other people waiting, sorry. But UCAD have appealed against the decision of the independent panel they employed. So that's kind of muddied the waters a little bit, hasn't it? It's like they're appealing against themselves almost. Yeah, but he still won. I mean, you know, and that's like no one's acknowledging that Conor Ben won his case. It's just I don't think he should have won his case. But you know, you weren't even in a trial. That's, that's like a guy coming up for a, you know, a crime in court and you go, oh, I, don't, I think that's ridiculous. You don't know anything. You don't know any of the facts. So you can't just say that's a joke. He won before an, an independent panel. Anyway. Eddie, always appreciate it, mate. Cheers, mate. Thank you.